This is Abe Friedtanzer from cinemadailyus.com, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with Jan T. Yates, the costume designer for The Last Duel. How are you doing today? Terrific, and thank you so much for interviewing me about The Last Duel. Of course. A film this... that is very close to my heart. Well, so this film, it starts with each of the main characters putting their clothes on, which I think is one of the best possible showcases for the costumes right from the beginning. I don't know if I was just paying attention to that because I knew we'd be speaking, but it was a great opportunity to see and really pay attention to what they're wearing from the very first moment. Could I just correct you and say they are putting their armor on? So what is, what is the distinction for you as a costume designer between armor and, and uh, costumes or clothing? Well, armor is a very complicated um, setup because you have to, A, you have to design it, B, you have to originate it, and C, then you have to find somebody or a company who will create it in polyurethane. And then you have to find a company who will paint it to look like real metal. Well, I've been very fortunate. I had two of the best armorers who actually made the armor, the armors, I should say, because they're all different. There was two battle armors for Adam and for Matt and two dual armors. And uh, they were originated um, by two very, very, very accomplished um, armor makers. Um, Terry English and Carl Summerskill. And then we then went to FBFX and they then took the casts and they made them and they made like 12 or 15 of each of them because we obviously had stuntmen, we had stunt riding, we had clean, we had bloody, we had clean and bloody, muddy and bloody, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and for both actor and stunt. So you always have to make hundreds, really, it seems like. And then you have to make sure that the paint effects doesn't, don't look operatic and that they really do look like metal. And FBFX have now got this down to such a fine art. I really wouldn't go anywhere else. They're amazing. Um, and then you have to make sure that they fit. And after that, you um, basically, um, you then wait for Ridley to change everything. And he did, he put a half visor on the helmets because he went, I mean, nobody duels without a visor because you'd get a lance in your face straight away. But he quite rightly said, I don't want them in visors because you're not going to see who's who. So he devised uh, this half visor that he and myself and Terry English sat around a table in uh, Ridley's office and we just drew something literally on a on a back of an envelope and Terry went away and created them which was amazing. Wow. So yes that is the difference whereas for a costume you're basically choosing the fabric, you're choosing the trim, you're choosing everything and your cutter is making it, or your cutter is cutting it and your sewing room is making it. So you have a little, little more control really. You're obviously comfortable working in the, you know, the period era, you've done a lot of films that are somewhat like this. Do you, what kind of research did you have to do for this particular film and uh, this time period? Well, I always start from the beginning, absolutely. And to be honest, I've never done full armor ever. So that was just terrifying, really. I took both my armorers to Los Angeles, which is, you know, we're both, we're all from London and Cornwall, but you know, I took them there and we fit Matt and we fit Adam with the original metal armor. So there wasn't any, well, obviously there's always problems of chafing and things like that, but you know, we had a very good start. Um, it was simpler in the costume department because you know, it's soft fabric, it's trim, it's everything that was simpler, but I've never had, um, I mean, Jody had something like 18 to 20 different outfits 
and there were a lot of other major actors. There was her mother-in-law, um, played by the estimable Harriet Walter, <coughs> Dame Harriet Walter, and um, her best friend, it was her maid, and I took them to Paris where they made them at the costume, de, no, Compagnie de Costume, excuse me. And they made <clears throat> probably about altogether 15, 20 outfits for them all. They, they made them very well. They did. Do you have a favorite or one you're most proud of uh, from among Jody's wardrobe? Oh, yes, the last one. I loved it and I loved what I'd done. Ridley had fallen in love with them because I'd researched the hell out of it. And we were just going through the files and he went, oh, I love that. And it was where everything comes from is mainly effigies. And you get wonderful costume reference from reference, excuse me, from effigies. Um, and he said, this is fascinating. And I just interpreted it as a black collar which we added to the dress, it was separate, but we added it. And it just gave her so much majesty. Also, um, another effigy was um, we nicked for Adam's battle armor, which you can see when he's just poncing around with Pierre and he's been given the garrison to run and it's gold rings around each breast and gold detail on the stomach. And they did that so beautifully. I just fell in love with Adam every time I saw him in it. He looked so gorgeous. He never fought in it or hardly at all. Um, and he certainly didn't do his, uh, he didn't do his duel in it. The duel armor was taken from the, virtually the, because um, it was a true story, the last duel, and it was taken from um, the Farnsworth donation to the Met, where they had this wonderful canvas colored cuirass, which we virtually, I mean, to say we stole it is not fair really, but we used it as inspiration. And uh, obviously one was red and one was blue. And all the characters have very um, lengthy and visible either hair or facial hair. Is that an important uh, thing that you're working with the hair and makeup departments uh, on designing the costume and the armors because of that? Um, no, no, I, I've never been one of those costume designers that sits over the hair and makeup. I know I'm, I, I can, I could, but I'm, I have so much faith in them and not enough time, really. You know, I just hope that they're going to do a beautiful job, which they did. And uh, I loved, I loved Adam's long hair. Um, I don't know, Ridley has this thing about mullets and he loves a mullet. We put a mullet on uh, a lead actor in Raised by Wolves and uh, very much the scars and the bitty beard was what we took from Raised by Wolves and put on Matt. And I think he rocks it. I think he does very well. You He's not a nice person anyway, you know. <laughs> he, he wrote this script. He wrote it with Ben. And he plays not, I mean, he's a nice person, but he's just, he's a, he's a soldier. That's true. So you've worked with Ridley for two decades now. Do you have a, a shorthand or certain expectations that you know will, you know, have in any projects? No. <laughs> no, I've only done a few projects with Ridley, but I've been very lucky to be asked back. And yes, Gladiator now is bloody 20 years ago. That's shocking, isn't it? Is it really? Yeah. Wow. Well, I do work for other directors. I've worked for Michael Mann. I've worked for, you know, subsequent to Gladiator. I worked with Jean-Jacques Anno. I worked with um, Julian Anderson. So, you know, I have worked with other directors, but we have a great amount of shorthand obviously Ridley and I, and uh, that is a great help. It really is, it's a huge assistance along the way. Um, but I always, he's very, very hands-on with costume and he's a complete inspiration to me, he really is. And uh, he'll give me such a thorough brief, 
you know, that basically I know where I'm going and I just have to, um, sorry, I just have to um, check when I'm fitting people, check with him, I send him all the photos, you know, I just, I just need him there for me, you know, because his opinion is so valuable. Yeah, and you have another film of his that's out this year, which I assume was an extremely different uh, production experience, and that's House of Gucci. And I, I, as far as I understand, um, you didn't go to Gucci for you know consultation. So how did you create these lavish clothes from scratch? And is that something that was a real challenge or a great opportunity or both? Oh, it's a terrific opportunity. And um, Gucci were kind of they were kind of helpful. Um, they finally, their archive was always moving. And my producer had said, oh, you'll be able to wander through the archive. Well, you imagine sort of wandering through um, some sort of wonderful labyrinth of costume and bags and things like that. But because they were moving, basically it um, was 16, 18, 20 garments, you know, outfits. 15 bags and it was just in a room so we went there we looked at it we photographed it then um lg was we were able to ship it at a later date to um la where it was you know stayed at gucci's and then we were able to fit it on lg she fit everything like a glove and then it went back and finally we were allowed to um to keep it once we started filming in the February um, in a strong room and the bags were there as well. So they were, they were, you know, they let me have the archive, which is very nice, but they're very protective of Alessandro Michele. And of course he's their, he's their go-to money man. So, you know, that's fair enough, but it, you know, basically, um, um, LG, no, not LG, Patrizia Reggiani didn't really like Gucci clothes. So we were making, my cutter was making Yves Saint Laurent, Dior, Givenchy. I was pulling vintage costume from all over the place, you know. So it was, it was a great experience. And also the men, I had them all tailored, excuse me, because they were Savile Row tailoring. We just moved ahead. So on the note of inspiration and working from something that, you know, exists, you did work on a few uh, films in the Alien fr franchise, starting with Prometheus. Is that something, did you refer back to the original designs that were so influential in the 1979 movie, uh, or did you want to start with something new for those? Yeah, well, we looked at them. And in actual fact, um, because of course Ridley was there, he said, no, it was a uniform. It looked very ununiform like those shirts and pants. Um, but they all had, um, you know, soldiers registration numbers and they all had like a lapels, uh, not lapels, sorry, epaulettes. And they all were actually, you know, and they had little stripes of color, but we didn't really go there. We, you know, we had enough on our plates designing these spacesuits and the helmets, which were so immense, they were just a tour de force. We had something like a thousand LEDs in them. So we were actually lighting the actors. We had sound in there, which was recordable. So we had, you know, it, they were wired for sound, but to record. And then worst case that we had 11 monitors in each helmet which were working with tech on them and so we had like four or five here two in the back and three on the uh, brow and they were a nightmare because the batteries kept running out but you know all of this could have been done perceived by cgi even back then in 2010 or 2011 I'm not sure and you know however we did it all and i'm very proud of that and so with their on board wear, it was just trying to find something that looked futuristic, but was classic and didn't look, 
oh god you know you watch that in five years time and it looks completely off the wall you know Ridley always because I go what about this going diagonal stripes you know a la Captain Kirk or Star Trek you go no <laughs> so we you know kept everything down to a dull roar on the uh, with the onboard costumes same with um same with um Alien Covenant um and the same actually with the Martian we just wanted to get things that you'd look at and you'd think well that's nothing special you know but it's nice and it looks good and uh it's not going to rock the boat i guess there was that because it was all about the spacesuits in all of them the one thing we had to do for alien covenant was we had to get parkers and trousers and um and waistcoats made and i used craig green the uh british designer i kind of stalked him and because uh, he was unknown, I'd seen him in a store, I think, and uh, not him, but his designs. And I went, Christ, that's what I want, because it was futuristic, wonderful padding, lovely, you know, really, really innovative take on, you know, what can you do with a Parker? Nothing. But he had done the most brilliant things. So he made all our all our Parker sets and trousers and waistcoats. And I do, I like all the sci-fi work that you do, but of course we talked before about Gladiator and I know that there is a new film coming out soon that I believe you're working on again with Ridley. I'm not sure what you can say about that, but what do you, is that something you're eager to revisit? And is do you think that, has something changed in the 20 plus years, whether it's technology or your approach, whatever, uh, to that material? Well, we are actually working on Napoleon. So we're working on Napoleon, who's going to be played by Joaquin Phoenix, which will be very exciting. I keep hearing about Gladiator 2, and um, I haven't talked to Ridley about it, but, you know, I'm just happy to be employed. I think it will be hugely reduced from the last time because we were fitting 3000 extras a day you know we were fitting them and they would all be we'd start at two in the morning and we'd finish at 10 in the morning or 10 30 they'd all go and be on set in the uh, coliseum and then they'd all rush back again at five they would be much quicker getting undressed than getting dressed well now we only need probably 250 or 400 or something like that we, we will never need those 3000 again so that would be a huge relief <laughs> from from a getting sleep point of view i'm sure and you started your career in the fashion industry is that do you think that what you're doing now is similar to what you started and is there any advice is there any advice you'd have for people who are looking to make a switch like this well, to be honest, I realized I was very shortly, short time in fashion. And I realized I, you know, I didn't have the flair of, I don't know, Alistair, Alistair, uh, Alexandra McQueen. I didn't have the flair of that sort of craziness. And also I didn't have any money. You know, you need so much money to set yourself up. And I realized, you know, that basically, this probably it was a much better field for me because anyway, I was always telling people they didn't look right or they dressed peculiarly or why are you wearing those shoes with those trousers? Now I realize it's come in quite handy because I can dress anybody however I want. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to say. But no, I, I would say just get your basic training, go to art college, learn to pattern cut, learn to make clothes, because then you can tell the drape of fabric, you can understand that you can't dye polyester, for example, you know, just get a basic in, in, um, in dress design, cotton, uh, sorry, costume design, and then just become an assistant, assistant, assistant for no money. And just be nice, and they'll ask you back and then they might pay you something or whatever and start with commercials you know there's so much out there 
so much out there. A lot of people are getting elevated too quickly, I feel, because there's so much work in America. And uh, are you East or West Coast? I'm in LA. You're in LA. So Atlanta's the big place in America, isn't it? That just never stops. Well, we have all our studios are bursting at the rafters because they've got all the streamers, you know, working out of there. And uh, there's just so much work. So to anybody new, persevere, suck it up and just work for nothing to begin with and never say no. Wonderful. Well, I'm a big fan of your work and I really appreciate the chance to get to know more about it and especially the distinction between costumes and armor, which I'll never forget now and I'll educate <laughs> others on. So thank you so much for speaking with me I'm, today. I'm so sorry. I was like an awful old maiden aunt. No, armor. <laughs> thank you so much. It was very nice to talk to you. Thank you. you.